<clears throat> well, hey, Journey family, Pastor Stephen here, and we are at our Wednesday night service. I'm so glad that you're joining us tonight. We're going through the book of James each week on Wednesday nights in our online service, and tonight we're in week five of our series through the book of James, and we're going to be talking about temptations tonight. And, and so as we look at temptations, as we look at James uh, chapter one, we're going to look at the the end of chapter one here. This is going to be a challenging message. I know for me, very challenging. So I'm really excited. And just prepare yourself as we dive in to God's word. Jesus, thank you. Uh, thank you for your brother, James, and writing this book and giving us um, clarity on, on what temptation is and how do we fight temptation and, and where are you in the midst of temptation. God, thank you. Help us to see clearly, to hear your voice clearly as we look at your word tonight. In your name, amen. Well, all right, church, James chapter 1. In the book of James, we're, we're looking at a faith that works, a faith that works. James 1, 13 through 18. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. Sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. I think we've all experienced how temptation leads to sin, then sin just leads to death in our lives. Verse 16, So do not be deceived, my, my beloved brothers, now, remember, as he uses beloved brothers, it's, it's a familiar term. So this is brothers and sisters. Every good and every perfect gift is from above. Every good, some gifts are good gifts, and then some gifts are the perfect gift you need. may not be the gift that you wanted, but it's the perfect gift. It's from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So as we look at temptation tonight, I've got three things to say. I've got temptation uh, that we're driven to worship. Uh, and then I'm, I've got this other point of, uh, that we're created to live because in our text here, it talks about death or life that we're created to live. And then finally, uh, the gifts of God, that God is the giver of gifts. And what I want to say first is temptation is something that is a human experience. Temptation is a human experience. Even Jesus, who's perfect, was tempted. That's right. So hear me. Even Jesus, who is fully God, fully man, lived the life we couldn't live, died on the cross in our place for our sins, he rose on the third day, defeated our greatest enemies of Satan, sin, and death. Jesus was tempted. Jesus was tempted to not go to the cross, but he did it anyway. Jesus was tempted to give in during the 40 days of fasting in the desert. Jesus was tempted by Satan himself. Jesus was tempted, but he never sinned, which means, which means the pressure of temptation never let up for Jesus. Because here's the reality about temptation is when we're tempted, that temptation, that pressure builds. I really want to eat that chocolate bar. I really want to eat that food. I really want to drink that drink. And I say no, and I say no, and I say no. And the longer I say no, the more there's a sense of temptation building in our lives. And Jesus never gave in to temptation in any way. Well, I know for me, I'm tempted by a lot of things. I'm tempted every time I drive past Buffalo Wild Wings to go get wings. Literally, I love chicken wings. And when I drive past Buffalo Wild Wings, I think I would really love to go to Buffalo Wild Wings and get some wings because I love chicken wings. Uh, when I drive past or, or go um, in my close to the chocolate shop ice cream shop, which is uh, this awesome Wisconsin chocolate ice cream shop. If you haven't ever been to chocolate shop ice cream, you got to go. It's like the best. Now, some of you may be thinking, Pastor Stephen, you don't eat dairy. You're right, but Chocolate Shop has phenomenal soy 
ice cream. Now, I know you dairy lovers, you're thinking, why would you ever eat soy ice cream? Because I don't do no regular milk anymore. I do soy milk and almond milk and oat milk. And Chocolate Shop Ice Cream has the best. You cannot get any better with their dairy-free ice cream. I know this seems like an oxymoron, but I am tempted by it because it is so good. Now, as we look at temptation, the, the truth we need to see is that resisting temptation and learning how to uh, resist and, and overcome sin and temptation is built on small moments. And I think a lot of us, we watch movies because we're in the pandemic right now, right? And we're all like watching Netflix and Disney Plus and all these things. And, and because a half hour television show is trying to fit in so much content or a two hour movie, a lot of times we see characters that uh, seemingly make these massive life decisions and overcome temptation in a critical moment, and then they win the day. Now, that's a great story, and I get how that works for stories, but it doesn't really work for my life, and I know it doesn't work for your life, because the reality is, if we're just sitting around not resisting temptation, then when a big temptation comes along, we're not going to have the strength to resist it. And a lot of times... Large moments of temptation really arise from a life that lacks discipline. So hear me out, because if we look at temptation, we're going to look back at the text, but these are the opening remarks. Uh, here, here's the reality. The, the more I resist temptation, the less I put myself in situations where my life hinges on a single decision, or I may make a really poor decision that ruins things for the rest of my life. As we resist sin and temptation in small ways, we actually through wisdom, even avoid major, potentially life-altering decisions in our life. And so as you look at resisting sin and temptation, I want you to see that all the small ways you resist, all the small ways that you lean into the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome sin and temptation actually builds on itself. And you develop a strength and you develop a trajectory of your life where you avoid a lot of things that people actually end up getting themselves into. So the person who resists small temptations develops integrity and learns that they can resist things. The person who doesn't resist and gives in does not develop the strength to resist in large moments of their life. And in fact, when without the developed strength from resistance, you will be drawn into situations of immorality and struggle without even knowing it which is why James steps in here and James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. God never tempts us, but he has given us as human beings agency. He's given us freedom. He's given us the the ability to be tempted and to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, resist that temptation. For God cannot be tempted with evil. He himself tempts no one, but each person is tempted when he is what? Lured and enticed by his own desire. And this text, what this is teaching us is that any temptation you have, it's something that you're desiring. It's something that you're desiring. So as we begin to look at temptation, I want you to realize that all the temptations you have and, and, the, and these struggles that you're having, there is something that God has made you in his image and likeness. There's something you want, and Jesus is holding out good things for you that will satisfy that desire, but the world holds out other things that will also satisfy that desire. So um, let's look at some of those things. Uh, Because we're made in the image and likeness of God, we're driven to worship. And if we don't worship Jesus, then we're going to worship other things. What are we going to worship? Money. What are we going to worship? Sex. What are we going to worship? Power. What are we going to worship? Comfort. We've heard me talk about this before. What's our worship going to go to? Control. Where's our worship going to go? Significance. (coughs) (coughs) Who? Excuse me. So if, if we're made in the image and likeness of God and we're driven to worship, then I want you to see the temptation is being tempted by money, sex, power, comfort, control, significance. Being tempted by any of those things is not... The, pro- the problem is not in those things in and of themselves. Money 
in and of itself is not evil. Um, sexual pleasure in and of itself is not evil. Uh, power being used rightly is not evil. Having comfort, not evil. Having control over something is not evil. Having the desire for significance, this is not, these are not evil things. However, when we make them God things, right? When we don't worship God, but we start to worship money, sex, power, comfort, control, significance, what ends up happening? Well, we end up giving in to temptation. Now, you may be thinking, Pastor Stephen, I thought you were going to talk about really, really specific sins. Here's the thing. I could talk about my specific sins. I did initially, right, my temptation to go to Buffalo Wild Wings, or my temptation uh, to really want to be a, uh, get soy ice cream from chocolate shop. I'm tempted towards anger. I'm tempted towards, um, you know, being... Uh, being really bitter at times and, and unforgiving. But my temptations, they may be the same. You may be tempted to anger, but the reason why you're tempted to anger is different than my reason. So we need to talk about the, the underlying issue, the worship issue that's in temptation. So how do we overcome sin and temptation at the worship level? Well, it has to do with believing God is good we don't have to look elsewhere. God is great. We don't have to be in control. God is gracious. We don't have to prove ourselves. God is glorious. We don't have to fear others. And we need to train our desires to want God more than the things of this world. So as you look at this first part of the James, how are you training yourself? In, in what ways are you resisting temptation in small ways and then building up a resistance and building strength because we're all enticed by our own desires. I don't know what your desires are. I know what mine are. And, and there's, a, there's, there's an opportunity as we look at this that after you hear this teaching for you to go spend time with Jesus and hear from him and talk to him about where you were tempted. Talk to him about the things you're struggling with and how he wants to satisfy the desires of your heart. And he doesn't want you to keep going back to worshiping the things of this world. Because we resemble what we worship. So when we worship Jesus, we become who God meant us to be. But when we worship money, sex, power, comfort, control, significance, what ends up happening? We end up resembling those things. And our life actually gets smaller. Verse 15, the desire, then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. So as you begin to worship, as you begin to see that your temptations to sin are a worship issue, what's at stake here is life or death. What's at stake is life or death. See, we are in this world right now where sin is in the world and entropy is a reality of our life, meaning everything goes from order to disorder. Entropy is the slow movement towards death that all things this side of heaven experience. And as we begin to give in to our desires, as we begin to give in to our desires and then sin, we actually speed up entropy in our life. But when we trust in the living God, when we worship God, it's, it's as though God extends the joy in our life. And that doesn't mean you, you have to live longer just because you worship God, but it does mean that, that there is wholeness in your life when you worship God. And you have met people who seemingly have everything, money, sex, power, fame, comfort, control, significance. They have everything that you want, and yet they're empty. What is that? Well, sin has given birth to death in their life, and they have everything they want, and yet it's like ash in their mouth. And God has so much better for us. But the way we access that is through worship, through worship on Sunday when we gather through worship during the week. Um, you know, I listen to a massive amount of music. I listen to you know, music meant for church worship and music that's just meant for any sort of thing. And I love music. I love all types of music. In fact, the other day, my boys they were like, Dad, why are we listening to country music? And I was like, I like country music. They're like, what? I said, I don't like all types of country music, but there's some that I like. See, I can listen to all types of music, but I recognize that listening to music meant for worship, man, that builds my heart up. Being in the presence of God's people, man, that builds my heart up. Uh, spending time in God's word, wow, that builds my heart up. Looking at my life, all of life is worship, that I'm pouring myself out to Jesus, and I want to worship him 
with everything that I have. I begin to then shift and I begin to have the strength through the power of the Holy Spirit to resist temptation. God wants to give us life, kingdom power in this life, kingdom living in the life to come, and shalom is what this means. Shalom meaning wholeness. Now, how do we do this? Because uh, Nicole is going to, man, she, I, in a couple of weeks, she's going to talk about faith and works. So you may be thinking, well, Pastor Stephen, how does this work when I'm super tempted? And James says later, uh, if you have faith but don't have works, then your faith is dead. So does that mean I need to like behave well and resist sin in order to have God love me? Absolutely not. But what it does mean is, is as we come to Jesus and he fills us with his Holy Spirit and he forgives us of our sin and empowers us with resurrection power, we can't help but resist sin and temptation. And the longer we as Christians filled with the Holy Spirit give in to sin, the more we will sense in our souls that it's wrong and we're going to be we're going to be led by God back to him and to repent. And one of the greatest works, in, if you would call it that, is the work of repentance. It is not a work that earns anything with God, but it's a work that brings us back to God, that, that brings us out of the fog of being tempted by money you know, or power or sex or control or significance, these things that just drive our lives and the world around us. God wants us to wake up from that and the beginning of that process is to repent. Now, I love how this text goes because James says, okay, so uh, when sin, when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. I don't want any of that. So then James says, but guess how good God is? What does he do? What does God do? Verse 16. So don't be deceived because the, the enemy, the world, they're not giving you good gifts. This is James is teaching us something here. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. Everything good that any human being has is from God. Meaning, God is so amazingly gracious that even people who hate him and don't love him, God is giving them good things. Every good and perfect gift. Not every good and perfect gift the Christian gets. Every good and perfect gift anyone ever gets, that's from God. The devil never gives you a good gift. Don't, don't be deceived. That's what he's saying. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived by money, sex, and power and all these things of the world. Every good thing, every, 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 every perfect gift comes from God, the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Why is that important? Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that God is not changing. He's not, he's not gonna, you're not going to wake up one day in the midst of your sin and temptation and find God not being faithful. That in the midst of our struggles with temptation, God will remain faithful. That's what James is teaching here. Yes, we'll be tempted to sin, but God's not the cause of it. So don't be deceived by the world thinking, well, I don't love God and I have good things. How many times have you heard that? I don't love God. I seem to have a good marriage. I seem to have money. I seem to have all the things I want in my life and I've never loved God. What is James saying? No, all of those things are from God. Every good and perfect gift is from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be kind of first fruits of his creatures. What is he teaching there? He's teaching that we as Christians, we as believers in Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the resurrection power, forgiven of all of our sin, are the beginning of, of a whole new way of living life where we can enjoy the good things God has given us. We can enjoy everything God has given us and not worship it. And, and outside of the power of the Holy Spirit, what, what happens to people? Well, they, they, get, they see the good, the good things in money, sex, power, and comfort, control, and significance. And, and instead of worshiping God, th- like using those things for the glory of God and enjoying their life, they, they worship those things and they deny God. And then what happens? Death comes into their life. And we as God's people have the opportunity to first be the first fruits of this new people, this new humanity that walk, that with faith that works, faith that works in every area of our lives, faith that comes into 
Dane County, comes into Madison, Wisconsin, and begins to say, there's a better way to live. That begins to say, there's shalom and peace and wholeness that you can have. That's what he's saying. And notice here, he's not saying the first fruits of an arrogant people who make fun of people who aren't as blessed as them. No, of his own will, not our will, not our works, he brought us forth by what? The word of truth. So as we begin to be obedient to the word of God and live a life of holiness by the power of the Holy Spirit, then we're the first fruits of his creatures. Fruit is something, what is it? Something sweet, something that comes in. We're, we're coming in the spring here in Madison. I know as you're watching this, you're thinking, it's the beginning of March. Is it really spring? Listen, I'm just speaking that out. But fruit, fruit's something everybody gets to enjoy. And when your life, when you go into this world full of the Holy Spirit, empowered by God, and fruit is coming off of you, everybody benefits. And that's what God wants for us as we come in to Dane County. We need to see our gifts as coming from God and do these two things. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to be grateful because thankfulness is a key to happiness. Thankfulness creates space for humility in our lives. And Nicole's going to teach on humility in, in just a few weeks. So what should we do with all the good gifts that we have? Be grateful. Thank you, God. You should, we should just be thanking God all the time. Praise the Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for this small thing. Thank you for this small thing. Why? Because every good and perfect gift comes from God. And then what else do we need to do? We need to be generous. The good in our life is for us and those around us. Let me say that again. The good in our lives is for us. Okay, I'm not going to deny that God gives us good gifts, and that's awesome, and we're blessed. But that blessing doesn't end with us. It actually extends out from us into our community, not just towards Christians, but everyone in our community. Not just towards people who look like us, but everyone in our community. Being a loving neighbor means being a loving neighbor to the LGBTQ community. It means being a loving neighbor towards people. Uh, if you're somebody who, um, who looks at people on the right side politically and you don't like that side, uh, God is saying be generous with everyone. Uh, if you're somebody who looks on the left side of the political spectrum and you think, I don't want to be generous towards them, God is saying you as a Christian give up the right to withhold and you are, you are commanded to be generous. Because every good and perfect gift is not from you. It's given to you by God to then be grateful and be generous. Take part of every gift from God and be generous in some way. Be generous with the people around you. Be generous with, with your family, with your friends. Notice, notice what, what James is doing here. James is saying, at the beginning, he's saying, yes, we're all going to be tempted. We're not tempted by God but we're tempted when our own desires get out of whack and that desire gives birth to sin and sin when it's fully grown brings forth death. The opposite happens, okay? As we worship God, instead of being tempted by sin, what ends up happening is we begin to see everything we have as a gift from God and then we begin to be generous and our worship of God increases and our generosity and our gratefulness increases to where things that used to distract us and tempt us don't do that anymore because we have trained our hearts that instead of grumbling with what we don't have, being grateful for what we do and watching as God blesses us with more. You see, the person who, who has given in to sin and temptation and death has become to creep in, what, what, what ends up happening is they, they have a scarcity mindset. It's never gonna be enough and I, gotta, and I, and I, and I operate like an orphan where the contrast here in the second half of this text is saying you, you will be the first fruits of his creatures, meaning you're a part of the family of God, this new humanity that walks by the Spirit of God, in the power of God, with the love of God, going into your family, your workplace, your city. And what ends up happening? Everybody gets to enjoy the fruit. This is... This is an amazing thing. So let's not look down on people who are tempted. Let's see that when someone is addicted to drugs, when someone's addicted to pornography, when someone's addicted to a lifestyle that is destroying them, as Christians, our job is not to look down on them and, and to condemn, but it's to see with a broken heart that the issue is a worship issue. 
Are there systemic issues in, in our society that keep people oppressed and, and it makes it really difficult for them to get out of sin and temptation? Absolutely. Do those systemic issues have to be fixed? Absolutely. But the way a person, an individual, goes from those sins and temptations into a life with God is worship. That worship is out of whack and their worship needs to be addressed. And as we begin to address individual people and their worship, what ends up happening is we begin to look then at systems and we begin to see that actually systems and institutions have been created by people who didn't love God and created by people who created an unjust system. And now we have the opportunity as people are changed to then begin to see systems changed. So Christians, let's, let's have some compassion and empathy towards those who are tempted. I, I looked at my son the, um, just the other day. He was playing a video game, and he lost some battle, uh, and he was playing online with his friends, and he got so mad at himself. And I came in, and I said, buddy, be, being kind is not just about being kind to other people. It's all about being kind to yourself. Recognize that you're not, you're not a victim but there's misplaced worship. And Jesus came not just to forgive sin, but actually to fix us, body, soul, and spirit, and to see us walk in wholeness and shalom in our lives. So to recap, we are tempted, but we're driven to worship. So temptation is a worship issue. God is good. We don't have to look elsewhere. God is great. We don't have to be in control. God is gracious. We don't have to prove ourselves. God is glorious. We don't have to fear others. To see that God wants us to be about life and not death. And to also see that every good and perfect gift anyone has in this world is from God. So what do we want to do? We want to be grateful for everything God has given and be generous. Jesus, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for teaching us uh, tonight. Thank you for our gifts. Thank you for every good and perfect gift you've given us. Thank you for not just giving it to people who love you, God, but you are so generous and gracious and abundant with, with all that you are, that you bless even people who don't love you. You bless our city. You bless our country. You bless everyone in the world. It's every good and perfect gift is from you. And God, we just recognize that. And then we recognize that you're not tempting us to sin, but you've made us, you've given us a way out of sin and temptation, and that way out starts with worship. So God, help us increase our faith to worship you and to see that our hangups and our sins and the things we're struggling with, at the core, this is a worship issue. And God, you want to solve that worship issue by turning our eyes to you, Jesus. So we look to you. Thank you, Jesus, in your name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, week five of our teaching through James. Uh, I'm excited. I'll be teaching next week, and uh, we'll continue to work our way through the book of James. You are greater in the eyes of the Lord than you are in your own church. Love you.